even though 2020 has been dicey, I encourage you to keep a winning attitude in 2021. Be safe, be well, and be awesome. Welcome back, you clever person. Justin here with Clever Tagline, and today I'm walking through the dice pixelation effect for that piece that you just saw. Before diving in, I need to let you know this will not be a normal tutorial style video where I built the whole thing from scratch. Instead, I'm going to dissect the already assembled project file. Now, I will be going into a good bit of detail while I do this, but I'm also gonna gloss over a few things. So you'll need a basic to intermediate understanding of HitFilm's features, especially building and embedding composite shots and creating and animating masks. This effect was built using HitFilm Pro version 16, but it should also work in a lot of prior versions as well. The only effect that's really a pro specific kind of a thing is also available for Express in an add-on pack, so your Express users are not left out. I'll talk more about that effect once we get to that point in the walkthrough. Okay, enough jibber jabber, let's roll some dice in this HitFilm tip film. The first thing I did when building this setup was to create a composite shot where I could build out the dots representing the different faces of a die. So I built a faces composite shot here. It's 500 by 500 pixels. I chose a size kind of arbitrarily, but it tended to work out pretty well. And I made it only six frames long, and I'll show you why here as I go along. So when I open this up, what I first built was this center plane down in here, just a single plane. And then I used a mask to create this circle right here in the middle. And then what I did was I used copies of that layer along with some keyframing to create the different patterns here. And I set this up so that it began frame one was the one dot, frame two was the two dots here. So what I did for this was use opacity keyframes on this center plane here. So it goes for the center dot, goes on, center dots off when these two appear, these two layers here. On frame three, the center dot is keyframed back on and reappears for number three. And then for this one, we're just adding the two other corners there, keyframe off the center dot again. And then for number five, keyframe the center dot back on. And then because those are all set up on the individual frame numbers, that plays into the next phase of things. The next phase was to build some layouts that would contain the different arrays of all of these die faces and save those out as images. I had a big, medium, and small size that I wanted to use. So big meaning the larger die faces, small meaning the really tiny ones. So what I did for this was first off figure out how many die faces across I wanted to go. And I'll just use the big one here as an example. I decided to go with a very simple starting point for this. With the aspect ratio of the frame being 16 by nine, I decided to go with 16 die faces wide by nine tall. So what I built then was this big face arrays composite shot. And in there, I dropped my faces composite shot that has the individual die faces, again, on frames one, two, three, four, five. But to build out the arrays like this, I first off scaled a single die down to the proper size. So the scale for this one, to make it 16 wide, it was 24%. And then I positioned that one minus 900 by minus 480, and that puts it in the lower left corner. To create the arrays of faces here, I then use the clone effect multiple times to take that one single die from the corner and paste it out across the entire frame. The clone effect is available in HitFilm Pro as a standard feature and also in HitFilm Express as part of an add-on pack. The first one simply patterns this out, so I use a value of 9 on this, so I had a total of 10, so I can have 9 clones plus the one original and the offset was 500 pixels. The scaling all happens after the clone effects have been applied. And so I have nine going that way. I then clone that up another eight and that fills out what I need for the top. So again, one row here plus eight more makes nine tall. And then one more clone effect down in here. I just need one to fill out to the right and give me enough to fill the remainder of the frame. Once I had this done, I then used the export frame feature to export individual images of these different arrangements here of the different die faces. So the nice thing about it is I was able to go in here and change the option here for the frame counter to be display as frames. And then that way, when I exported this, I have my big face arrays. I'm going back to frame one, export the image. It's big face arrays one. That is the one single dot array, which is exactly what I want and I'm using PNG images, RGB alpha. And in this one, I don't want re-import to the timeline. I just re-import back to the media bin. And I just did that one every frame for the remainder of the frames in the shot here. And that is how I got all these images here in the images folder for my big grid. So now I have image versions of all of those and I use those for the later steps. 
for the other groupings I have down in here for the medium grid and the small grid, I just made multiples of the 16 by 9 of various numbers to spread those out and make smaller versions of those die faces. The next thing was to build a master source composite shot, which I did right up in here, standard 1920 by 1080. I made that 30 seconds long, but it could be as long as you want to for whatever it is you're doing. And it's pretty simple in there. I just wanted to be able to drop any footage I wanted to use, whether it's still image like this elephant image here or video or anything else that we use later on by the different layout groups that I made in these folders down in here. So for the rest of this, the basic process is the same no matter whether you're doing a, a larger grid, medium, small, whatever. It's just a matter of different math to calculate the size of the mosaic you want to use. So the first thing I did in each section was to build a composite shot that was simply taking that original source material and kind of squashing it down into a simple grid like this. And that was just done using the mosaic effect. So I dropped in my master source composite shot and added the mosaic effect to it. And then in my case, for my big blocks that I called it, I had that be simply 16 by nine. So 16 horizontal, nine vertical. And that gave me in this nice grid layout like this, which exactly matches the dice face arrays that I built previously. Once I had that source material set up, I then made five different composite shots to isolate the different tonal ranges I needed to display each of these different faces. So for the lowest tonal range, that would display the number one dot face from that array that I made previously. The number two, the next tonal range up and so forth. So I'll demonstrate the basic process here from one and then some slight changes I had to apply for two through five. For Big Blocks 1, I dropped in my Big Source Composite shot, so the one that had that pixelated grid in there. And then on that one, I added two effects. First off, I added Crushed Blacks and Whites. The original material looks like this. With Crushed Blacks and Whites added with these properties, it squishes it down to just the lowest tonal range of this particular thing. So I've got five tonal ranges I want to capture here, and that divides from 0 to 1 pretty cleanly. So I've got, you know, 0 to 0.2, so I drop my white value down to 0, and the black value to 0.2, and that range there allows me to isolate just the lowest tonal values in this image. But on top of that, to actually give me a simple black and white output, I drop the threshold effect. Now in this case, all of these tones are actually below the default 50% threshold of this particular thing. That's totally fine. I was happy to leave it with that. But depending on your source material, you might actually have some white blocks appear in this space. So I'm gonna close this out and then show you what happens with Big Blocks 2, where it gets kind of interesting. So Big Blocks 2, I have, first off, I dropped in Big Blocks 1 on top of that. I'll describe why I did that in just a second. So on my big source material in there, I did the exact same thing. Dropped in my crushed blacks and whites, but now with the next tonal range up. So from 0.2 to 0.4, from white to black there. Same thing, the default threshold uh, option in there. Now, if I had something from my big blocks one composite shot, some actual blocks like this that were showing up, that was also finding there was some overlap, some blending between these different tonal ranges. So what I then did, was to effectively take out whatever was done by Big Blocks 1. I dropped Big Blocks 1 on top of it and used the blend mode subtract. That made sure that anything that was selected by that Big Blocks 1 composite shot would be taken away from the one below it here and I'd be left with just the tonal range from 0.2 to 0.4 effectively. And these are the blocks that would then show the two dot faces in that array. Same thing happens with Big Blocks 3 and on up. So with Big Blocks 3, I open this up and now I've got Blocks 1 and 2. Again, those are both set to subtract blend modes on both of those. And then my Big Source down in here has the same two effects, this time 0.4 to 0.6. Same thing happens with Big Blocks 4. Big Blocks 5 is a little bit different because now I want to make sure I, I not only have that top toner range, but I found through some experimentation that to really get the full values in that range, I had to do a little bit something different. So for big blocks five, I've got one through four, and those are all set to the subtract blend mode like previously. So if I turn all those off, you will see it's pretty much everything. So if I take away the stuff done by block one, there was nothing in that one, but take away that, that portion there for blocks two, take away blocks three, take away blocks four, and this is just that highest tonal range on this layer here. 
Now with this one, I originally had this set to 0.8 to one, but I found it was actually leaving out some tonal values. So if I drop this back down to, you know, put the 0.8 range down in here, you're seeing it's actually taking out some values in here. And I wanted to make sure that pretty much everything left that was not part of the first four was captured by this option in there. So that's why I chose the value of 0.99 up to one. That gave me virtually everything else. So with that done, I've got big blocks one through five, each one isolating a different tonal range from my original source material. So the final part of the process was to assemble all the different pieces. And that was done in the final composite shot for each particular group that I made. So opening big final, what I've got in here, I have the array images that I built previously. If I unhide those now, you see each one isolates again a different tonal range based off of the block composite shots that I just talked about. These each use the set matte effect. So the actual composite shots I just talked about, blocks one through five, are down at the bottom, but they're all locked and hidden. So for big face arrays one, for example, the way that is set up uses the set matte effect here to target big blocks one using luminance and making sure to use the replace option there. So if I hide the other layers, you'll see kind of similar to how big blocks one didn't have any actual tonal values represented there. I don't have anything showing up for big face or raise one uh, with the set map. But again, depending on your source material, you may have a few blocks in here representing those darkest parts of your original source. So big face arrays two comes in. These are the ones that are the next tonal range up. And then same thing for three, for four, and for five. That covers the basic dice pixelation effect. Now to create the expansion of those dice layers in the finished video, I made a few more composite shots, each of which contained a white plane, some animated circle masks to reveal that white color, one more animated mask set to subtract mode that gradually collapsed around my face, and then the mosaic and crushed blacks and whites effects to blockify the whole thing. Those composite shots were then used with the set matte effect to drive the visibility of the different dice pixelation composite shots in the big final assembly comp. Finally, to help make the transition from original video to dice a little smoother and more interesting, one more comp was made to create a pixelated darkened version of the original video with its visibility driven by a matte comp similar to those driving the dice layers. Thanks for watching and thanks again for your patience during the delay between the last video and this one. I won't go into details, but similar to my employment shuffle in the spring of 2019, life during the pandemic has been interesting. Unfortunately, I haven't been as consistent as I like and I can't really promise when the next video is going to come out, but I can promise one thing. In the words of a very, very wise man, I will never give up, never surrender. Thanks again, and until next time,